Good afternoon. My name is Nuncia Manuli. I'm the Assistant Vice President for University Events, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the fourth annual President's State of the University Address. To begin our program this afternoon, I ask that you please all stand for the singing of America the Beautiful, which will be led by Justin McGriff, member of the St. John's University Voices of Victory and College of Professional Studies, Class of 2019. Following the singing of America the Beautiful, please remain standing for the invocation which will be delivered by Reverend Bernard Tracy, CM, Executive Vice President for Mission. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O beautiful for pilgrim's feet who stern in passion stress, a thoroughfare of freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thy every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. Let us pray. Lord God, we gather together unified in your name, seeking guidance, wisdom, and support as we reflect on past accomplishments of the university and look ahead to working together to promote a brighter future. Grant us courage, boldness, and discernment as we seek to work hard to make St. John's prosperous as an institution of higher education. May good practice be the cornerstone of everything we do. Lord, reveal new possibilities in areas of expansion and development. Let the university be of great service to our students, alumni, and the local, national, and global communities. May we be strong and courageous, make wise decisions guided by the Holy Spirit, and not be afraid or discouraged. May our university grow and flourish, creating great potential and provision for all those educated herein. Lord, we close our prayer today asking that you bless us with the gifts of our Catholic and Vincentian heritage, inviting us to be part of, a, of traditions that build on the wisdom of the past with a vision open to the challenges of the future. It is in your name that we pray together. Amen. Thank you, Justin and Father Tracy. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Atem Kang and Tazi. Atem is a senior in the College of Professional Studies, majoring in Health and Human Services, and currently serves as president of Student Government Incorporated on the Queens campus. Please welcome Atem. Hello, everyone. My name is Atem King Tazi, and I'm your president of Student Government Incorporated. As a proud member of this great university, I am honored to introduce to you our president, Dr. Conrado Bobby Gempasaw, as he delivers his fourth State of the University Address. During last year's State of the University Address, Frank Obermeyer, former president of Student Government Incorporated, spoke about he and Dr. Gempas how he and Dr. Gempasaw had something in common. They were both in their fourth year at St. John's, making Dr. Gempasaw a senior just like him. <laughs> well, I too have something in common with Dr. Gempasaw. 
which is that he is the first minority president that St. John's has ever had, and I am the second black female president that Student Government Incorporated has ever had. And to me, this symbolizes an acceptance of change and a foreshadowing of the internal growth that is to come at this illustrious institution. Amazingly, with all of his work, with his strategic priorities, Dr. Gempersaw still finds time to show his St. John's pride. Whether it's cheering on our Red Storm, attending mass, or stopping by university events, you will often find Dr. Gempersaw and his wife, Dr. Clavel Gempersaw, supporting our students. Dr. Gempersaw, on behalf of the entire St. John's student body, thank you for making me and the rest of the student body proud to call you our president. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm St. John's welcome to Dr. Conrado Bobby Gempesa. Good afternoon. A little bit louder. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Atem, for that very kind introduction. I'm, I'm always honored to be introduced by a fellow president. Welcome to the fourth annual President's State of the University Address. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the Chair of the Board of Trustees, Bill Collins, and I believe there are several members of the Board of Trustees here, including um, Anita Gomez Palacio, um, Joe Matone, Father Kevin Cray, Jim Shannon. Did I miss anyone? Thank you for your attendance at um, today's event. I also welcome the Vincentians, students, faculty, staff, administrators, alumni, and friends, and supporters of St. John's University. Using technology, we are in, joined today by our colleagues at our campuses in Staten Island, Manhattan, Hop Hog, Paris, and Rome, as well as our alumni and friends who are watching this event through live streaming video. So class, no need to take notes because the video will be posted on our website. No, when I started the State University Address four years ago, I said my goal was for making this an annual event to promote an atmosphere of open communication, collaborative leadership, and shared responsibility. The President's State of the University Address is an opportunity to review our strategic priorities, our accomplishments and challenges, and to discuss future initiatives in response to current challenges in higher education. To start, let me say it loud and clear that the state of St. John's University is strong, stable, and remains true to its mission as a Catholic and Vincentian University. Speech over. <laughs> this past August um, last month, there was an article published in the New York Times entitled The iGen Shift. Colleges are reaching are changing to reach the next generation. It states that the newest students on campus are transforming the way the schools serve and educate them and its members are the most ethnically diverse generation in history. This is also a generation that wants to solve the world's problems. And we have our students here today and they can relate to this news article. Another article that was published last month from the Washington Post, titled, Despite Strong Economy, worrying financial signs for higher education, pointing out that unlike the millennials who were willing to pay for the college experience and go into debt, Gen Z or iGen will, are more focused on value and price. It means that colleges and universities won't have much ability to raise prices in the future, putting more pressure to cut costs, develop different pricing models, or build entirely new models for the traditional four-year residential college. Furthermore, in Deloitte's higher education practice, they came out with a higher education industry outlook. 
They say that the pressures on higher education today are unprecedented, ranging from federal and state policy, rule and regulatory changes to the ongoing challenges and demands from parents, alumni, and students. College and university leaders are facing new disruptions across the academic enterprise, and it is more critical than ever that leaders employ strategies for approaching change and modernization proactively. In the face of this constantly evolving higher education environment, we at St. John's must strive to be proactive in our response to these challenges. Three weeks ago, more than 120 faculty, staff, students, and administrators participated in the fifth annual President's Retreat. The participants discussed the revision of our strategic priorities, action items, and action steps, and offered recommendations and changes in response to the new challenges and opportunities. I thank our colleagues for their many insightful comments and suggestions. The recommendations are now being reviewed by the President's Advisory Council and will be presented to the Board of Trustees next month. As many of you know, if you've been here four years or more, we have had some success in enrolling large first-year classes in 2015 and 2016 with an average of 3,250 students our strategy was to focus more of our recruitment efforts on our primary market, particularly here in New York, especially Catholic high schools and public high schools. That strategy worked for a couple of years. In fact, recent data show that among the top 20 colleges and universities in the state where New York high school residents, seniors, enroll 19 of the top 20 schools are public institutions. And St. John's is the only private institution in the top 20. However, enrolling the largest number of New York high school seniors among all private colleges and universities in the state also exposed us to a major challenge in 2016. That year, the New York State legislators passed a new state budget providing free college tuition called the Excelsior Scholarship to any student whose family income was $100,000 or less per year. As a result, we enrolled 2,967 first-year students in 2017, which was about 280 students less compared to the 2015 and 2016 entering class. This year, Family income eligibility for the Excelsior free tuition program was increased to $110,000. We expect to enroll a slightly larger class this fall semester of about 3,100 plus or minus, George tells me, between 25 and 30, but still about 150 fewer first year students than before the Excelsior program was implemented. We continue to be impacted by that program. Despite our recruitment challenges, we have the distinction of having enrolling the largest first year class of any Catholic university or college in America. Our first year class enrollment at Staten Island is estimated to be around 235 to 240 students, higher than last year's 187 first year class enrollment. This is the second year, this is the second class in three years that we have enrolled more than 230 entering first year class in Staten Island. We can also report sustained enrollment of students from Catholic high schools. In many Catholic high schools in New York, we remain the top school that students want to attend. And we will continue our effort to recruit students from Catholic high schools given our mission as a Catholic and Vincentian University. As you can see, from 20, 2010 to 2014, our total enrollment dropped from 12,211 to 11,082, a loss of over 1,000 students. But during the last four years, we managed to increase our enrollment by 844 um, students by enrolling a larger class. If you see the figures below, 
We have been averaging the last four years 3,142 students in our entering class, while the previous four or five years, our average was 2,852, about close to 300 students less. In 2017, our total undergraduate enrollment without college advantage program, and I'll explain that program in a second, increased to 11,771, and we expect this number will rise to almost 12,000 students this year, which will bring us to the record enrollment levels in 2010. On the academic profile of the class, I'm very pleased to report that the average SAT score of the entering class this year is estimated around 1175, higher than the 2017 average of 1158 and the 2016 average of 1147. But a better predictor of student success in college is high school GPA. The high school GPA of the freshman class this year is estimated to be 90, matching the record high of 90 the previous year, and this is the third year in a row that we have maintained the high school GPA of 90 for our entering classes. This year's class also includes 13 valedictorians and nine salutatorians. 60 students joined the Catholic and Ozanam Scholars Program, and 323 students are enrolled in the Honors Program. Students from 37 states and 129 countries are where our students came from, including Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. I mentioned about the College Advantage programs. How many of you know or have heard of the College Advantage program that we have here at St. John's? About two-thirds of you. The College Advantage program is another successful program we have on campus. We call it CAP. It provides qualified high school juniors and seniors with the opportunity to enroll in credit-bearing St. John's courses while still in high school. If I remember the exact year correctly, I believe the federal government starting 20 years ago in 1998 required that students, whether they're college or high school, if they take college credits, they should be reported as part of your enrollment. So when we report to the federal government, we include the College Advantage program. We have established partnerships with more than 120 high schools in our area and have increased our enrollment in the College Advantage program from 3,500 in 2010 to a record of almost 5,000 students this past year. I am aware, unaware of any other university that has that extent of enrollment for their College Advantage um, program. It is because of the growth in our CAP enrollment that our total undergraduate enrollment, with, including the College Advantage program, has increased from a low of 15,676 in 2011 to an estimated high of, of almost 17,000 this year. One reason for our success in recruiting students to St. John's is in the increase in the number of accepted students who come to visit our beautiful campus, see our teaching and learning facilities, and engage with our faculty, students, staff, and ad administration. So we looked at the data over the past five years, and we have achieved record attendance for our Accepted Student Day event, reaching more than 2,300 accepted students this past spring. The good news is that once a student or their parents visit our campus, the yield conversion for those students is about 60%. The other weekend, during move-in day, I went to the residence village and welcomed the new students and their parents. I usually start by going to the individual rooms and introducing myself. But then I realized that a number of the parents said it was not necessary because they already knew me. And I said, how did you know me? And they said that they were at the accepted student day presentation and they still remember what I said when I spoke there. And so what did I say at my presentation last April. 
I said that, is, that it is very important that our students have a good understanding of different cultures and traditions and to engage with a diverse group of classmates, faculty, administrators, staff, and alumni, including their own university president. And today, when in our next accepted student day, I will also say and add, including their own student government president. Thank you, Atem. As you know, our university already mirrors the demographics of New York City and what America increasingly will be in the future. So you have an understanding of what we do at our accepted student day. I thought you will find this interesting to share uh, the video that we show to our accepted students. And I have to, do I have to get it perfect the whole way through, or? To answer your question, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I looked up. <laughs> I would tell my freshman self to visit the University Career Services office on campus. Speak up. If I could, that is what I would tell my freshman self. Never be afraid to take chances. Be excited about getting involved in campus activities. One thing I have always cared about is Relay for Life, which raises money to fight cancer. Everyone's actually really willing to help out, especially the staff, the faculty. They're all willing to help out in any way because that's what they want to do, to help students achieve their goals and to succeed in their careers. I did not realize the full extent of the resources offered by Career Services until one of the deans began telling me about it. I've definitely met a lot of like great friends just at all the different sport activities. Meeting people that are just excited about sports as you, finding like that common bond and interest as a freshman. So that was definitely something that created a home for me and I found my friends that way. I was nervous about going to career services at first and did not feel qualified for anything more than an entry level job. My career advisor changed that. They've helped me get jobs, they've helped me get internships. It's never too early to pay them a visit. But it's still important to find your niche early and I personally chose service. It's one of the main things that we're built off of. It leads you to so many different pathways regardless of whether it's doing a midnight run or just being involved in the church or just tutoring students, your fellow Johnnies. I think the diversity at St. John's is very important because the people I've gotten to know from different places have encouraged me to just kind of expand my mind. Coming here and meeting people from places like Texas and Arizona and Venezuela or Colombia. A lot of people are actually interested to know that you're from a different culture with a different background and they're more than willing to know more about you and help you out whenever you need it. I've wanted to go explore the world a lot more. I just think that's brought into my horizons. That is what I would advise. I would tell. I would urge my freshman self. I mentioned to, to you that um, we enroll the largest freshman class of any Catholic college um, or university in um, America, more than 3,000 students. Um, no one's even close to the number of students that um, we have to recruit. It is not easy to recruit and bring 3,000 plus students um, to our campus. So I think at this time we should thank and commend our enrollment management colleagues led by George Rodriguez, our Chief Enrollment Officer. Thank you. And now for um, the not so good news. Let's talk about our um, graduate enrollment. Since 2012, enrollment of new graduate students has been declining. In 2015, we started to reverse the trend with a slight increase to 1,394 entering graduate students. This year, we expect to enroll an entering class of almost 1,600 students. We also expect that our 2018 total graduate enrollment 
to reach around 4,600 students. While we have experienced slight increases in the entering class, total graduate enrollment still has not recovered from the decline that started in 2010. The average entering new graduate students in the previous years from 2010 to 2014 was 1,529. While the average entering new graduate students during the last four years is about 1,479, about 50 students less. As I've said last year, the implementation of various recruitment strategies to increase graduate enrollment continues to be one priority area that requires our attention. Interim Provost Simon Muller has taken the lead in reversing this trend, and I offer this optimistic projection. We expect that with the new graduate programs to be offered in the next couple of years, particularly in the health science and professional fields, we will reverse this total graduate enrollment decline. Now, for a summary, let's look at the total university enrollment, adding our undergraduate and graduate enrollment. And let me explain. From 2010, to 2014, both undergraduate and graduate enrollments, excluding co college advantage program, we lost about 2,080 students. However, CAP enrollment increased by 1,174 students. From 2014 to 2018, undergraduate enrollment increased by 844 students, CAP enrollment increased by 300 students, while graduate enrollment declined by less than 100 students. Despite continued challenges in our total graduate enrollment, gains achieved in undergraduate and college advantage program enrollments have allowed us to reach the highest total enrollment for St. John's this year, at around 21,500 students, an increase of more than 1,000 students since 2014. Now let us discuss student success outcomes, which is our number one priority in our strategic priorities. I have said that student retention and graduation must be our priority and our shared responsibility. Of course, we expect our graduate, our students to take their academic courses seriously and to learn both inside and outside of the classroom. If our goal is to ensure student success, we need them to stay in school so they can graduate. However, historically, student retention has been a major challenge for us. In reviewing the trend data during the last 20 years, the average retention rate from 1997 to 2002 was 82.6%. However, for 11 consecutive years, starting in 2003 until 2013, the average retention rate declined to 78.1%. I will show in my next slide that the decade-long lower retention rates from that period had a direct impact on our six-year graduation rate remaining below 60% for almost 10 years. Today, I am very pleased to report that over the past four years, our retention rate has averaged 82.7%, similar to what was achieved 20 years ago. This means that with an entering class of about 3,000 students, an additional 130 to 140 students are retained annually and hopefully will graduate in four to six years. I challenge all of us as members of the St. John's community to make every effort to help retain and graduate our students. If we do this well, our university will also meet its Catholic and Vincentian mission of helping those most in need. Remember 
that among the top 20 national Catholic colleges and universities in America, St. John's enrolls by far, by far, the highest proportion of Pell Grant recipients. And more than 4,000 of St. John's New York State students received the tuition assistance program, aid, which is the largest number of students from any school in New York. Now that we have shown that we can improve retention rates on an average of almost 83%, I ask that let us set our retention goal higher and increase our freshman retention rate to 85 or 86% and help transform the lives of an additional 60 to 90% or to 90 students. This is not a matter of saying 83, 84, 85. 1% improvement is about 30 students, 30 human beings that we took the responsibility of accepting them to St. John's. It is also our responsibility that they will finish so that they could be good contributors and positive contributors to society. One of the key metrics of a successful university is if the students graduate. The national six-year average graduation rate for nonprofit colleges and universities is about 64 percent. From 1997 to 2002, our average graduation rate was 62.5 percent, close to the national average. However, because of lower retention rates from 2003 to 2011, St. John's average graduation rate six years later for the period 2009 to 2017 declined to 57.8%. So today, I am very pleased to inform you that for the first time in 10 years, our graduation rate is projected to increase to almost 61%. We expect that the gains we have achieved in increasing our retention rate during the last four years will translate to a higher graduation rate, particularly starting with the class of 2015, whose six-year graduation rate will be reported in 2021. Hopefully, if we continue to increase our retention rates, the graduation rate starting from 2021 onward will be higher than the 64% national average for not-for-profit private university. This is a very good foundation as we prepare for the, our 150th anniversary in 2020. In two years, we will be celebrating 150 years since our founding by the Vincentians to provide an excellent education to those most in need. In preparation for that big celebration, I would like to announce today that Andre McKenzie from the Provost Office and Nuncia Manuli from Advancement and University Relations have agreed to serve as co-chair of the task force to plan for our 150th anniversary. We will soon announce the membership of that task force. Thank you, Andre and Nuncia, for your willingness to serve as our leaders in this major celebration. And then another major step towards ensuring the success of our students is career placement. I'm very pleased to report that each year we have been raising the bar, with the class of 2017 posting a 94.3% career placement, up from 86% in 2011. We congratulate our faculty for providing a rigorous academic program that prepares our students well for the next phase of their careers. We also congratulate the Office of Career Services and many faculty, administrators, staff, and alumni for the mentoring, guidance, and assistance they provide to our students in finding meaningful, meaningful jobs and graduate school placements. Following the theme of this year's President State of the University Address, which is building a culture of inclusion, partners, and, ch and change, I invite our Chief Diversity Officer, Nada Llewellyn, to give an update of the numerous initiatives we are undertaking so we can make St. John's a more inclusive and welcoming campus community. Nada?
Thank you, Dr. Gempisa. Good afternoon. I'm going to start by introducing the new Office of Equity and Inclusion. The office was created over the summer as a way to create a framework for some of, for some of our more significant equity and inclusion initiatives. Within the office, we have the new Equity and Inclusion Council. Over the summer, the Task Force for Diversity and Inclusion and the President's Multicultural Advisory Committee, or PMAC, merged to create the new Equity and Inclusion Council. So now we have a permanent entity, larger in scale, that's focused on moving forward in this space. I co-chair the task force with Dr. Manushka Kasignal, Associate Clinical Professor, College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And the charges of the council are the same as those that were set forth for the task force. To ensure that the training for staff and administrators and the professional development opportunities for faculty are sufficiently robust in the equity and inclusion space to effectively recruit and retain faculty, staff, and administrators from historically underrepresented groups, to advocate for equity and inclusion to be embedded in our curricula, and to foster a more inclusive campus climate. Also within the Office of Equity and Inclusion is the Student Subcommittee. Last spring, all students were invited to apply to serve on the Student Subcommittee, then for the task force, now for the council. Of all the applications, 24 students were selected and they'll begin their work this semester. And their work will consist of reviewing and vetting council recommendations, formulating their own recommendations that'll be informed by their fellow students, and engaging in a number of community, community projects. Uh, what, one of is the collaboration with Dr. Jeremy Cruz from the Theology and Religious Studies Department, and we're calling it our Prevention, Repair, and Accountability Project. This project was born out of the acknowledgement that biased motivated incidents and prejudice motivated aggression has occurred on our campus and will unfortunately continue to occur. And this is because while acts are committed by individuals, we know that prejudice and discrimination are embedded in our society as a whole. We know that oppression is institutional, it's systemic, and we can't bar it from entering the campus gates. But what we can do is create a campus community that examines itself and actively counters social injustices in an ongoing way. To that end, this project seeks to effectively communicate to students the university's position on prejudice-motivated aggression, that it's antithetical to our mission, the policies and procedures that are in place to prevent incidents from occurring, and then changes we've made in how we've responded to incidents. Additionally, and importantly, subcommittee members will engage the student body to learn from students about what exactly is needed with respect to the university's prevention, repair, and accountability measures, and work with the council to implement those recommended changes. Also within the Office of Equity and Inclusion is the Office of Multicultural Affairs, or OMA. OMA was formally housed under Student Affairs. Over the summer, it moved over to the Office of Equity and Inclusion. And in its new home, we're launching a new student intergroup dialogue program, identity-based support and discussion groups for students. We're expanding into Staten Island. We're in the process of recruiting for an assistant director of OMA on our Staten Island campus. And we'll be continuing the diversity peer education program, Project AIM, the Asian Alliance, and Heritage Month celebrations. And new for this year, we'll be celebrating Indigenous Peoples Heritage Month. Also within the Office of Equity and Inclusion is the new Inclusivity Resource Center. This student center will be led by a new executive director of OMA, which we're also in the process of trying to recruit and hire. Hopefully we'll have someone in place soon. Uh, but the executive director will report to me in my capacity as chief diversity officer. And the genesis for this new student center came from the acknowledgement that we needed to create a place of belonging for minoritized students, a place of advocacy and of informed dialogue. So we will offer regular social justice trainings for students in the new center. We will have equity and inclusivity themed workshops for the entire community. There will be a mental health counselor available for both individual counseling and group programming. And the grand opening for the center is scheduled for September 28th, 
two short weeks away, uh, and you'll be receiving communications about that shortly. But a little spoiler alert, these are some pictures of this space. Um, you may notice that in the larger conference room, the walls look very blank. That's because another one of the subcommittee projects is to work with the design and construction team to actually uh, design the graphics together for this space. We also have a new academic center for equity and inclusion, which, we, which will be led by Dr. Manushka Kasignol, who will serve as the center's director. Uh, the academic center will report to Dr. Andre McKenzie, the vice provost for academic support services, with dotted line reporting to me and my capacity as chief diversity officer. And in response to form, former provost Robert Mangione's invitation, a working group was assembled to really develop a plan to operationalize the opening of the center. The working group was composed of, and is composed of 17 faculty members, as well as five advisory members. Uh, and they've established pillars for the center, which are inclusive teaching and learning, personal and professional development, dialogue and racial awareness, advocacy and assessment. They engaged an external consultant to conduct a faculty climate survey to understand the demands and needs of the faculty with respect to equity and inclusion. And we purchased an institutional membership in the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, which is both a recruitment and a retention tool. And the grand opening for the Academic Center is scheduled for October 8th, 2018, and you'll be receiving additional communications about that opening as well. And we have another picture of the Academic Center office. So I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, the design and construction team, particularly Brian Baumer, Jacques Theus, and Tobias Bisharat. Um, they worked extremely hard to put us in a position to be able to open these centers this fall, so we're very thankful for that. Also within the Office of Equity and Inclusion is RESPECT, the university's first bias response team. RESPECT stands for Respond and Partner to Engage Our Community Team, and will be composed of faculty, staff, students, and administrators. The role of RESPECT will be to inform the entire community of available resources, both on campus and externally and to track reported incidents of prejudice-based aggression so that we can design responsive educational opportunities. Uh, we'll, particularly, we'll be looking for any patterns. So if we receive multiple reports of something happening in a particular residence hall, for example, then the programming would be designed and delivered to that specific location. We'll also be collaborating with faculty to expand the resources we're able to offer to the community. And an example of that is our collaboration with Dr. Natalie Byfield from the Sociology Department, who is working with us to incorporate academically-based justice offerings that are really geared towards elevating the consciousness of students who violate the university's policies against bias and discrimination. And applications and nominations for respect will be solicited very soon, this month. And finally, there are a couple of members of the Office of Human Resources I wanted to flag, just because they've really been key partners in pushing forward some of our inclusivity initiatives. The first is Keaton Wong, our Director of Equal Opportunity, Compliance, and Title IX Coordinator. Her office oversees the investigation of all bias complaints, whether uh, we're talking about students, faculty, staff, or administrators. Also, Diane Neofetidis, our Director of Recruitment, She's really spent the last year and a half implementing best practices changes in order to support the recruitment of faculty, staff, and administrators from historically underrepresented groups. So that's looked like ensuring that hiring managers are interviewing a diverse slate of candidates, um, retaining a consultant to deliver implicit bias training to PMB committee members. We have another training uh, that's coming up in the next couple of weeks on effective recruitment practices. It's been being really thoughtful and strategic about how and where we place ads. So those measures and others, again, really looking for the best ways in accordance with best practice to support our recruitment of faculty, staff, and administrators from historically underrepresented groups. And finally, we have Eileen Caulfield, our Associate Director of the Training and Development Department, who has oversight of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Certificate Program. This is the program that launched about a year ago uh, that started with the Train the Trainer program. And this cohort of employees are gonna be responsible for delivering the diversity training and modules to the entire uh, employee community. 
Um, and at the conclusion of the 18 month long program, they will return to their individual departments and units and really be charged with being the university's first inclusion practitioners, meaning that they will be looking at the policies, practices, and procedures in place within their respective departments and units to identify where there could be barriers to more, uh, to more inclusive culture and practices, flag those, and then work with the council to eradicate them. So that's the Office of Equity and Inclusion. I had just a couple of other additional updates I'd like to share. The first is the adoption of our preferred name policy. This policy came about because of concerns raised to faculty uh, by members of the student group spectrum. And the concern was that there was a need to be able to designate an alternate name or a preferred name, particularly in the classroom setting. So as a result of the voicing of those concerns, the Office of Equity Con and Inclusion collaborated with the Office of the Registrar, Public Safety and Information Technology to adopt our preferred name policy. So now students can designate a first and or middle name of their preference to be used in email, class rosters, and storm cards or student ID cards. We are also continuing our Telling Our Story project, which is a project that was conceived by and is led by Dr. Susie Pack from the History Department. And it grew from the understanding that as we begin to think through our longer range equity and inclusion initiatives, as we begin to be thoughtful about who we wanna be in this space, we need to have an understanding of who we've been, what got us to this space. So uh, Dr. Susie Pack is looking at the history of the university from its inception, from the beginning, and paying attention to shifts in demographics and putting them in historical context. And she will be presenting community presentations on this project beginning in spring 2019. Last spring, we announced that the Department of Public the Department of Public Safety was engaging a consultant to do essentially an inclusion review of the department, to look at the policies, practices, and procedures in place, identify barriers to a more inclusive culture, and provide recommendations on how to address them. That review has been completed. Public Safety has begun to enact some of those changes, and you can visit the website uh, you see here uh, for an update on what they're doing, which they will continue to update as they roll out additional changes. While the Public Safety Department review is concluding, the Campus Ministry review is beginning, they've also engaged the consultant to really perform the same review, looking at policies, practices, and procedures, identifying barriers to more inclusive culture, and seeking recommendations on how to address them. And finally, I wanted to make sure everyone knows the Office of Equity and Inclusion has a website. I would encourage you to check it regularly. We'll, we'll be posting there to update the community on our progress with respect to all of our different initiatives. I wanted to end with the university's inclusivity statement. This statement was adopted at the end of the spring semester, spring 2018, and it reads, a dedication to diversity, equity, and inclusion is at the heart of our mission. As a Catholic and Vincentian University, St. John's is committed to institutionalizing practices of inclusive excellence to ensure that we welcome and celebrate the intrinsic worth of all members of our community. We will become an even stronger university as we enhance equity at every level of our institution. As noted in our vision statement, our graduates will excel in the competencies and values required for leadership and service in a rapidly evolving world. So I wanna draw your attention to the first sentence and our referencing of the mission. I think it's important that we're all very clear that the university's commitment to equity and inclusion and the work that we do in this space is not separate or apart or distinct from our mission, but it is our mission. It's how we live our mission. And we can't be true to or responsible to our mission if we're not paying attention to and being intentional about matters of equity and inclusion. And beyond it being our identity and our responsibility, it's also our opportunity. It's been proven time and again that teams and departments and units and corporations and institutions that are diverse and inclusive are more innovative, more creative, more easily adaptive to changing conditions 
So given the changing landscape of higher education, given the shifting demographics in our nation, a true and active commitment to equity and inclusion could be our pathway to future excellence. But we have to be willing to walk that path. So if you haven't been involved in any of the university's equity and inclusion initiatives, the Office of Equity and Inclusion has multiple opportunities for you to do so. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say equity and inclusion, I would encourage you to be curious about that, to educate yourself, and have that be your entry point into the work. It's not too late to become a part of what we're trying to do, of how we're trying to move the university forward. It's not too late, but the time to start is now. And I'm hoping that we can all move forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Nada, for your leadership. We still have a lot of more work to do here at St. John's in this area, but um, I, I really appreciate your um, leadership, your, your patience, and the hard work um, that we have to do to make our campus more um, welcoming and inclusive. Moving along to our strategic priority to our em employees and resources. Since fall of 2014, we have hired 182 new faculty members. And this coming year, we plan to hire 38 more um, faculty members. Also, we looked at the data, and during the last four years, 275 new administrators and 85 new staff employees have also been hired. In this year's incoming faculty members, the 43 new faculty members, 60% are females, and more than 50% of the faculty hired are faculty of color. Last year, because of the impact of Excelsior Free Tuition Program and other external recruitment challenges, including student requests for more financial aid, the hiring process committee, the dreaded hiring process committee, I should say, had to slow down the approval of hiring of new employees. Because rumors have been swirling this past year that we froze employee hiring, I want to make it clear that was not true. That is fake news. <laughs> we actually hired 43 new faculty members and also hired 63 new administrators and staff last year. What is true, however, is that we did not hire at the same rate as in the previous years when we enrolled larger freshman cohorts. Why? Well, the introduction of Excelsior free tuition, tougher immigration policies from Washington, and regional demographic trends impacted our freshman enrollment in 2017. And as I will show in a few minutes here, we are very highly tuition dependent. St. John stands out among Catholic colleges and universities in America in helping students most in need. But we have a very difficult business model that requires us to manage and balance increasing expenditures and financial aid with flat or declining tuition revenues. Regarding this matter, I know that it is difficult to control budgetary expenditures but we have to operate on a balanced budget. I ask for your understanding that when your hiring or salary increase request is not approved, it does not mean we don't like you. It does not mean that we do not support you. It does not mean that we do not support your unit. We simply must be disciplined and cautious in approving expenditures because we have so many competing demands for our limited resources, chief among them is the financial support our students need, and I'll show you that number in a second. My personal commitment to all of you is I will always lead by example and share in our collective sacrifice. By being disciplined, we can avoid layoffs and termination of employees that other universities are undergoing now. 
And we can still hopefully award salary increases and exceptional performance awards, provide good benefits, and pay our bills. So at this point, I'd like to show you what our budget plans are for this year. In reviewing our FY19 revenue budget, that's for this year, it is clear that we remain a heavily tuition dependent institution with 91% of our revenues coming from student-driven revenues, including tuition, fees, room, and board. Let us remind ourselves, all of us, that many of these student dollars come to us from the labor of hardworking and financially strapped families that our Vincentian founders challenge us to serve. We are not a small institution. We are not a small university. Our gross revenue is about $622 million, but after deducting a budgeted financial aid for our students of $262 million, our operating budget drops to about $450 million, which is comprised of $360 million net tuition, $49 million housing and meals, and $41 million of other revenues. Other revenues come from government grants, unrestricted fundraising dollars, investment income from our endowment, and I'll show you detailed data on that, athletics revenues and facility rentals and conference services revenues. Unlike the federal government, we cannot print money. So we are required, that's supposed to be a joke, we, <laughs> we are required to operate on a balanced budget. This means if we have an operating net revenue of 450 million, our operating expenses cannot exceed 450 million. And 55% our 246 million of our budgeted expenses are allocated to support academic, instructional, and student services. I won't discuss the other expense areas, except I'll point out that we have a debt service bill or payment of 41 million. And let me explain what that is in more detail. Many of you have seen this chart probably for the first time, or maybe some of you have seen it before. And you might be wondering, how much is our long-term debt? In 2014, our long-term debt was 593 million, almost 600 million. This is the reason why we have a large debt service payment of 41 million. Because of our disciplined approach to controlling expenses, and not incurring any more additional long-term debt, we have been able to pay off 109 million of our long-term debt in the last four years, reducing that long-term debt to 484 million. One way of looking at this chart is if our long-term debt was zero, we would have more than 100 million dollars during the past four years to spend for operations, capital projects, and all the other requests that you may have. But because of the size of our long-term debt, we must repay at approximately 41 million for principal and interest charges. What that means is that we have to closely monitor our expenses so we can achieve a balanced budget. Our in the good news is that our endowment in 2014 reached 644 million, primarily due to the sale of real estate asset in the city and the appreciation of our endowment. He wanted me to know From 2014 to 2018, because of the growth of the equity market, sale of assets, and generous support from our alumni and friends, our endowment has grown to 757 million, an increase of 113 million. I hope that all of you And now, I'll show you our total assets and net assets. I mentioned to you that our university is strong and stable. You, I'm sorry. Um, I won't discuss this detail. From 2014 to 2018, our total assets grew from 1.4 billion to 1.5 billion. Because of our increasing endowment and declining long-term debt, 
our net assets have grown from 694 million in 2014 to 908 million in 2018, a 214 million increase in four years. My expectation is in a few years, that net asset, which means that it doesn't include our liabilities, will exceed one billion. We must thank our business affairs office, led by our chief financial officer, Sharon Watkins Hewitt, for their diligence and discipline in managing our financial resources so St. John's can continue to have a strong financial foundation while facing the unprecedented challenges in higher education. Let's give Sharon and his team a big round of applause. Another major project. Across the nation, about one-third of freshman students, 67% national average for private colleges and universities, do not return for their sophomore year. One major reason why these students do not return for their sophomore year is increasing cost of higher education. Every year, our financial aid office receives numerous requests from students for financial aid. Many of those requests eventually come to my office, particularly during the month of August prior to the start of the school year. I have received letters from students who are not only asking for additional financial aid for, to pay for tuition and fees, but also needed help for housing. I have received letters from parents. A single parent who was earning below $30,000 a year wrote that her dream is for her daughter to earn a St. John's degree so she can be a positive citizen and contributor to society. Another parent wrote how agonizing it was to withdraw her daughter from school because she was unable to afford her daughter's tuition. At St. John's, we try to stretch our limited resources to help as many students as we can. In fact, this past year, we provided more than 253 million of financial aid to more than 93% of our undergraduate and graduate students. About 98% of our undergraduate students receive some form of institutional aid, totaling 220 million last year, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, undergraduate institutional aid awarded by a not-for-profit private college or university in America. But the end of this summer, 80% of our in years past, the minimum technology I usually present faculty points of pride in so terms of grants, fellowships, and awards won by our faculty. I also show awards and recognition earned by athletics and other administrative units. Because of time constraints, I will not present those today, but I will highlight some of those awards and recognitions in the future issues of the President's newsletter. I would like to go straight to what we have been doing on our teaching and learning environment. This past year, we have more than 60 projects that was led by our facilities and um, services. One of those is the new media arts and design lab, called, I call it the Mad Lab. And it's a collaboration between the College of Professional Services and St. John's College to support programs in photojournalism, digital, media and communication arts, TV and film, animation, 3D, and art and design, advertising, and journalism. For those of you who are interested, it's on this building, and I'll show you a photo here before or after classes. From less than 1,000 users, a faculty years, member more than five, wrote to me recently and told me that he has been attending the weekly parent orientations this summer. He wanted me to know that at every meeting, the parents commented how nice the campus looks and how clean it is in our facilities. He said, obviously, the money used on how to keep the campus so beautiful and our facilities is well spent. I hope that all of you also agree that enhancing the teaching and learning environment is important in recruiting the best students. I am also pleased to inform you, I'm sorry, um, I won't discuss this detailed deferred maintenance projects in detail. There's um, a number of projects that was done um, last year. But one thing I thought I'd mention, if you noticed, um, there was a roof repair at Newman Hall this past um, summer. And the good news is that when it rained, 
the, they forgot to put the roof back. So our offices were wet. No, I'm just kidding, facilities. It actually happened. We were wet. Um, I'm pleased to inform you that the Office of um, Information Technology has also implemented several exciting projects this past year, including the design of the technology infrastructure of the new Media Arts and Design Lab. In addition, IT also collaborated with facilities and faculty to renovate the e-studio and the Center for Teaching Learning Office to support faculty technology and professional development. If you haven't seen it yet, um, you should visit the fourth floor of St. Augustine Hall. Um, the provost and I visited yesterday. It's a job well done. Another major project that um, IT conducted this summer was the conversion of the Marillac Computer Lab to a technology commons to incorporate 22 3D printers, virtual reality applications, and eSports technology or electronic sports. This is um, our technology commons, which is right beside the Media Arts and Design um, Lab. eSports is currently a half a billion industry and estimated to grow to 1.6 billion industry in two years. eSports stands for electronic sports, games that you could watch and play using um, the video. A recent study of almost 5,000 Gen Z high school students regarding their college search and communication preference showed that three-fourths of high school sophomores, these are high school sophomores, reported visiting a college website using their smartphones. And their preferred social media platforms are YouTube and Instagram. I'd like to announce that with the leadership of our marketing and communication colleagues and the support of enrollment management and information technology, we will implement a new website portal for our university that will be designed to be user-friendly not only for regular computers but also for mobile devices as well. The IT division has also continued to upgrade to implement the technology standards in our classrooms. In 2014, only 7% of our classrooms met the minimum technology standards established by the Learning Space Advisory Group. But the end of this summer, 80% of our classrooms now meet the minimum technology standards. And the plan is to upgrade all the remaining 40 or so classrooms in the next three years. Not only have we upgraded our classrooms, but our faculty and students have also increased their utilization of Blackboard. Not the traditional Blackboard and Chalk, I hope, but the web-based course management system that allows students and faculty to deliver the course online or use online materials and activities to complement face-to-face -face teaching. The number of students enrolled in courses using Blackboard has almost doubled from 7,327 students in 2015 to almost 14,000 students this past spring, and more than 1,000 of our faculty now use the web-based course management system in their classes. Another example of classroom technology to enhance academic and learning is lecture capture, which is a process of recording classroom lectures and discussions with videos and making them available to students for review before or after classes. From less than 1,000 users three years ago, more than 4,500 students and faculty used lecture capture in their classes this past year. And for our fourth strategic priority, partnerships and fundraising. In June of 2016, 1,666 alumni and friends attended our third annual Grand Alumni Homecoming Weekend. Since we started this event three years ago, close to 5,000 alumni and friends have attended this signature event. I must thank Nuncha Manuli, who has been our leader in uh, preparing our Grand Alumni Weekend for the past three years. Thank you, Nuncha. Membership in the McAllen Society for Planned Giving also increased to 668 members from 642 members. And membership in the Founder Society, donors who have given more than one million to our university in their lifetime, now stands at 58. You all have a chance to be a Founder Society member, and I invite you. In addition, I 
um, close to $11,500 donors supported St. John's last year, and more than 7,800 were alumni, with more than 2,500 of those donors made their first ever gift to St. John's. And now I'll show you data that you haven't seen. For 20 years now, we have observed and celebrated our President's Dinner every year. And during the past 10 first 10 years, when we started in 1990, the average funds that we um, generate is about 1.3 million. The purpose of the President's Dinner is to raise much needed scholarship funds for our students. Last year, we celebrated our 20th anniversary of the President's Dinner. And during the last 10 years, we have averaged $2.4 million, with last year recording, our, we, we had a record last year of um, $3.3 million. As I've said, the primary purpose of the President's Dinner is to raise scholarship funds for our students. I am indebted to the many generous donors to St. John's who every year make a gift to support the dinner and raise scholarship dollars. An even more impressive signature dinner is the School of Risk Management Insurance Leader of the Year Award. They started in 2002, and during their first 10 years, the average was about $1.8 million. During the next seven years, until this year, the average has increased to 2.6 million with a record set earlier this year, raising more than 3.6 million dollars. We commend the leadership of Brandon Schweitzer, who is watching this address on live streaming video. So Brandon, I can see you, but you can't, I'm <laughs> just kidding. And the faculty from the School of Risk Management for the excellent academic programs they provide to their students and for their effective engagement of the insurance industry, whose leaders continue to enthusiastically support the school. The generosity of our alumni and friends and benefactors is a defining characteristic of the St. John's community. During this past year, gifts to the university totaled over $27 million, an increase of $5 million over the previous year. This is a record fundraising amount in our university's history. Since FY15, in four years, our collective advancement efforts have raised close to $90 million. We continue to improve the cash gifts given to us by our very generous donors. We thank them for their strong belief in our mission and their confidence that the university is moving in the right direction. Some of these very generous donors are in this room tonight, today. I cannot thank them enough and also other donors for their continued support. Thank you very much. We also recognize our institutional advancement colleagues led by Chris Vopel for their successful fundraising efforts and for enhancing alumni relations and the General Counsel's Office, led by Joe Oliva, for their assistance in drafting complex donor agreements and negotiating legal requirements. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Professor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes. And now for the surprise. At this time, we Tonight, please stand and we will be hosting an event in the city which will be led by where we will announce thank the you. largest single gift given to our university in support of the School of Risk Management. Thy children there should be an applause for that announcement. <laughs> for now, I can tell you that it is an eight-figure gift. But what really makes this gift so meaningful and so special is the donor's enthusiastic support of student scholarships and faculty development. More detailed information on the gift announcement will be provided in my letter to the campus community tomorrow. I'm almost done. Last year, the National Bureau of Economic Research conducted a comprehensive study on student mobility to measure how effectively institutions enroll students from low-income backgrounds and graduate them into well-paying jobs and careers. 
based on the study results, the Chronicle of Higher Education reported that St. John's University was ranked among all Catholic colleges and universities, and there are 200 plus of those, second among all private four-year colleges and universities, and there are over 1,700 of those in the country, and 15th among all four-year public and private universities, and there are over 3,000 of those. This is one ranking that we should all be proud of and is consistent with our mission to transform the lives of our students, especially those most in need. I would like, before I end, to send, to share excerpts of a prayer that we used at the last President's Retreat in August. I like the prayer because it is very relevant to what we're trying to do here at St. John's, and it reads, it helps now and then to step back and take a long view. We plant the seeds that will one day grow. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. We have established momentum during the past four years because of your hard work and commitment to our mission and our strategic priorities. But with the constantly evolving challenges in the higher education, I'd like to end by asking the question, how should St. John's prepare for the next five to 10 years? How should St. John's prepare for the next five to 10 years? For now, to answer that question, I ask that we redouble our efforts in building a culture of inclusion, partnership, and change so we can navigate these unprecedented challenges and opportunities successfully. The new realities in higher education will require that we must be proactive in our action steps to achieve our strategic priorities. And sometimes change can be painful, especially if it affects us or you or me. And in some cases, we may have to sacrifice our individual interests for the good of our university. I am sincerely grateful to all of you for your efforts to improve and strengthen our university. I can assure all of you that together we will continue to meet the mission set by our founders 148 years ago to provide excellent education for all people, especially to those most in need, because we are St. John's. Clavel and I would like to thank you for your prayers and continued support. May God bless all of you, and may God bless St. John's University. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kempisaw, and thank you, Nada. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the program for the evening. At this time, we invite you to please stand and join us in singing our alma mater, which will be led by Justin. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thy children here today galore, Old St. John's, our dear St. John's, and true will they be evermore. Old St. John's, our dear St. John's, thy colors bright, the red and white, will wave aloft from morn till night. Victorious will show our might. Old St. John's, our dear St. John's, from fervent hearts we breathe our prayer. Old St. John's, our dear St. John's, as we commend thee to his care. Old St. John's, our dear St. John's, 
that he will guard thee by his might and be thy shield in every fight. Thou champion of sacred right, old St. John's, our dear St. John's. <laughs>